We'll intervene whenever we decide it's in our national security interest to intervene. And if you don't like it, lump it. The problem with America is not that we go around marauding around the world imposing ourselves. Mm. The problem with America in the last 10, 15 years since the end of the Cold War, really in the last 60 years, is that we've been too slow to get involved. I don't know how many Iraqi civilians were killed, but I can assure you that the number is the absolute uh, minimal that it's possible uh, in modern warfare. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. You know, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. Welcome to the Darkened Hour. Welcome to another episode of the Darkened Hour. I'm your host, Adam Fitzgerald. With me today is a very special guest. Mark Rossini is a former special agent with the New York City Counterterrorism Office and was one of just four FBI agents who was involved with the CIA's virtual station tasked to monitor Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, which was called the Bin Laden Issue Station, or ALEC Station, codename. He was trying to blow the whistle on CIA malfeasance relating to two 9-11 hijackers living inside the United States without sharing that information to the FBI. He's also one of the founding executives of the National Counterterrorism Center, where his duties including being responsible for the production of the president's terrorist threat report and the threat matrix, which detailed emerging threats of terrorism, where he would be debrief CIA Director George Tenet. He's also the subject of several award-winning books, including The Looming Tower by Lawrence Wright, The Spy Factory by James Bamford, and In the Eye of the Storm by George Tenet. He's also lectured extensively at the FBI Academy, CIA University, many government and private institutions regarding the Patriot Act, FISA, and operational duties and responsibilities of the FBI, CIA, and the NCTC. Thank you very much for joining us, Mark. My pleasure, Adam. Thank you for having me. Sure. Um, well, I'll start very simply. Uh, how sure. Did you, how did you end up at the counterterrorism unit? Well, what happened was I became an FBI agent in 1991. Uh, my first six years in the FBI, I worked uh, a variety of crime, if you will, whether white collar crime, fraud against the government, pill trafficking, um, a few homicides thrown in there due to people who were committing frauds, they killed their partner. Um, <laughs> And then in 1997, I transferred over to the Joint Terrorism Task Force because at that time, the task force was looking for experienced criminal agents. They didn't want to take new agents out of the academy and put them to work such a thing. They wanted only experienced criminal agents. And I threw my name in the hat and I was transferred over. Um, and my first squad was I-48 which was a squad in the Joint Terrorism Task Force, or the JTTF, which was responsible for Hezbollah, the FARC, IRA, the Tamil Tigers, and various other terrorism organizations, <clears throat> terrorist organizations. I worked preliminarily uh, Hezbollah, the FARC, and was also uh, liaising with the Kosovo Liberation Army, actually a very heavy Kosovo Albanian community in New York. So I was uh, put in that role as well. Um, and then East Africa happened. East Africa bombings of uh, Nairobi and Tanzania that happened simultaneously on August 7, 1998, which was a Friday. It's very important for future discussion that people realize why it was a Friday. But uh, then I was thrust into this thing called Al Qaeda and bin Laden, who I really had never heard before, even though I 49, the squad that sat next to me in New York, you know, we walled off. We didn't really talk to each other per se, right. what we were working on. And and I got sent over to Nairobi for almost three months. And then I came back and I did a very good job in Nairobi. I was the acting supervisor, basically running the daily brief, sending out all the leads, collecting all the leads at the end of the day, packaging all the work then doing the, you know, last midnight phone call back to headquarters saying what we did that day 
meeting with the ambassador, or liaising with the police chief, et cetera. And <clears throat> there was a great time. And when I got back, I went back to my squad. So I 48, that was just around Thanksgiving, 1998. And then there had been another FBI agent from I-49 named Dan Coleman, who had been assigned to Alex Station as of 1996, I believe, 97. And Danny had been intimately involved with Al-Qaeda bin Laden, and of course, a defector from Al-Qaeda named Jamal Al-Fadl, who had wandered into our American embassy in Eritrea and defected. And the CIA first took Jamal to Germany and then took him to the US, and his debriefing began in earnest with the FBI and Danny in particular. So, excuse me, um, because East Africa was I-49 responsibility, and Danny had been so intimately involved with monitoring the Al-Qaeda cells there before he had, he had to be pulled out of Alex Station to work full time as one of the prosecuting, well, work on the prosecution team to prosecute the perpetrators of the East Africa bombings. And that left an open slot. And that's when John O'Neill assigned me to be Danny's replacement at CIA headquarters at Alex Station. And that Ooh. took place in January, 99. And that's exactly the story. <laughs> right. It's a um, simple fact. For, for those who don't know much about John O'Neill, can you explain who was John O'Neill? Well, John O'Neill was the special agent in charge of the New York Office Division of National Security. At that time, counterterrorism was not yet its own division. So it fell under the national security branch. So John not only was in charge of the New York operation that was dealing with all the spies, all the espionage matters, Russians, Chinese, whoever, but he also had to deal with counterterrorism that fell under his purview. So he had an assistant special agent in charge for his espionage matters and assistant special agent in charge for counterterrorism matters. And underneath that, all the squads of the JTTF <clears throat> fell under that. And that's why I was assigned. So. John had that power to transfer me, if you will, uh, to be the FBI New York liaison, the I-49 liaison in particular, to the CIA. On paper, I got transferred from I-48 to I-49. Hmm. And I reported to the CIA to work there as the, I have to say, sometimes I say the eyes and ears, but sometimes I realize that that's really not a good um, statement because I was really there not to spy on them, okay? And I wasn't there to poach their information and I couldn't send their information to the FBI without their knowledge. So it wasn't being eyes and ears per se. It was more that when the powers that be in each organization had agreed that they would work on something together, mm -hmm. then I and Special Agent Doug Miller, who was an FBI agent on assignment from the Washington field office of the FBI. Uh, we're there then to be the point people to make sure that what the two headquarters or New York and CIA had decided to work upon, then I would receive word from New York saying, hey, we sent the lead to the CIA on Monday and it's now it's Friday. Where's that, where's that request? Let me check on it. Boom. Uh, or when the CIA had a need to know something about the FBI, I would make sure that the Bureau knew and make sure they responded, et cetera. That, and of course, a few travels here and there with the CIA around the globe uh, in, the, in my law enforcement capacity, representing, let's say, a joint unified effort to foreign services that we interacted with. Oh, it was a very interesting time, uh, an incredible time. Um, a lot went on, and, and I guess, you know, when, when history is happening around you, you sometimes don't realize what's happening. Mm -hmm. That's not weird. You don't realize the events that happen to you day to day that you're a witness to or the information that you become privy to. And you just kind of think it's normal. Like you kind of think it's normal. You go to work and you read about a bunch of guys broke into the, the embassy, the Nigerian embassy in Rome. Like, oh, all right, it's kind of weird. Why they do that? But you don't realize what that's going to play and become later on down the road. Or a meeting in Malaysia of five guys, you know, a bunch of guys that 
you scratch the surface, you know, had one of them had traveled halfway around the globe and you followed them. But then you realize they had visas to come to the U.S. Mm. And then you don't want to tell the FBI that. So it kind of puts you in a weird position. Um, to this day, I regret not just picking up the phone and saying, well, fuck you, I'm going to tell the FBI that we found, you found guys in Malaysia. One of them has a visa to come to America. Yeah. But that's history, that's life. And that's unfortunately what happened. And there's, and, and, and there's something deeper as to why that information never got sent. And you know, right off the bat, you don't have to ask any questions. I could just go on forever. Right. Um, right, off, right off the bat, there's no conspiracy that anybody wanted this to happen. There were no bombs placed in the towers beforehand. Nobody brought down tower number seven where the CIA had been had their office. A plane did crash into the Pentagon and people did die. A plane did crash into Shakespeare, Pennsylvania and people did die. And that plane was headed for the Capitol, right. not to the White House. Get that through your head. That's another lie bullshit that Dick Cheney spun to get people old. That's another story about Iraq and everything. Mm -hmm. But this shit happened and it happened on that day and it didn't have to happen. And what well, I know, go ahead. No, I, what I wanted to do was uh, just to yeah. reiterate on that. Um, I, I do, I do <clears throat> know that you feel that you are burdened with this guilt, but how you, it's easy to sit back and be an armchair quarterback knowing what happened afterwards. But at the time when uh, that information was not shared with the FBI, well, that, that couldn't have been your fault. You, no one knew about what was going to happen when they were coming into the United States. That's true. That's very, very true. But you realize now, you say, of all the other times that people did ask you for something, you said, yeah, this is what they're doing. This is what they're doing. You know, I kind of, because, you know, I would, even the, even the CIA people say, what's the FBI doing on this? Well, let me find out. Well, they're doing this. So it's kind of like, there were some things that you did pass unofficially because you said, hey, this is what's going on. But I remember being told that when and if we want the FBI to know, we will let them because it's right now we're working at the CIA. So you kind of say, okay, well, you believe that person. You believe that eventually they will tell the Bureau because it, it logically is the Bureau's interest, but you didn't think anything nefarious about it. Right, right. You didn't think there was any urgency because... You know, they said, well, that one person said to me, well, let the Bureau know we need to let them know. It's, 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 so you kind of go, okay, all right, they're going to do that. And you don't realize at the time what that meant. And if, of course, I did have a confrontation with somebody when Doug's memo was not sent. Right. You see, you see, everybody, you know, I'm nobody. You have to really thank Doug Miller uh, for taking the initiative to write the communication. Sure that did try to tell the FBI officially about the travel of Khaled Amidhar all the way from Yemen via Saudi or Dubai and all the way to Malaysia and what happened and, and the surveillance that went on in Malaysia and the fact that he's had a visa to America and his passport. Mm -hmm. Doug tried and then when his memo didn't go, he came to me and I intervened and said, why isn't his memo going? <clears throat> And then that's when I was told, it's not a matter for the FBI. When and if we want the FBI to know, we'll let them know. It's a CIA matter, and you're not to say anything. So you kind of go, okay. And I remember going back to Doug's desk, and Doug looked at me like I had two heads. And it was like, well, we both said, well, they have a good reason. It's their information. When, you know, they'll do the right thing eventually because it's, you know, it's, they can't operate in the U.S., so let the Bureau. It's the Bureau's jurisdiction. But you don't think anything nefarious about it at the time. Right. And it's just, it's just, you know, it, it, but it's, 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 no, I don't have, so to speak, yeah, the guilt or uh, it's just, it kills me that it was something so simple. And there, were, again, it kills me that there were other times when I did pass information, mm -hmm. people say, hey, like I said before, people say, what's going on with that case? What are they doing over there? Let me see. Oh, yeah, they're doing, but they didn't put it, whatever it was. So, this is sometimes the thing I can't wrap my arms around, but mm. it is what it is. Um, say, I mean, but it's okay. Okay. But it goes beyond me. See, this is, and my, my real problem is not 
so to speak, with me. My real problem is with the 9-11 Commission and the whole, so to speak, cover-up uh. of responsibility to what went on and the lies that were perpetrated about it. I mean, and it's not just me saying this, it's Richard Clark, who you, you can impeach me all day long, okay, because mistakes I've made in my life, but don't, you can't impeach Richard Clark. And no one's tried to impeach Richard Clark. But the fact of the matter is the 9-11 Commission was a bunch of, can't say BS, because they wrote a very good novel. And it was a truthful novel, if that makes sense, because it told a very good story. But it never answered a fundamental question, and it never approached what happened from the point of view that a dogged mm. FBI agent or detective or prosecutor would. Why did you not send that memo? If you send memos to the FBI every day about innocuous information that really means nothing in the grand scheme of things, just a pile of shit, you don't send that. You send to the FBI every week, every day, information about this Hezbollah member who had a phone call with some guy in America or met some guy who flew in from London or some Al Qaeda guy who sent money. But here you have an Al Qaeda subject that you knew that he traveled pursuant to a wiretap you had on his phone in Sana Yemen after the East Africa bombing. And you neglect to tell that to the Bureau. That's when it started to hit me afterwards saying there's something deeper here. There's something more that people, and it's not, I hate to use the word cover because it's just not logical. If you had a crusading prosecutor, like I had worked with in New York, likes of Mike Garcia and Pat Fitzgerald and Ken Karras and uh, Joe Bianco, all these, all these guys, that would have put the people in Alex Station all in the grand jury or put them on the witness stand and said, and say, you know, see the official communication between the FBI and CIA is what's called the CIR, a Central Intelligence Report. All you had to do, and I've done this on criminal trials when I went after doctors who were pushing pills and involved in scams and everything else, or were con men. You put up, you put up a chart for the jury. So, ladies and gentlemen, the jury. On January, in January 1999, the CIA sent a total of 100 cables to the FBI. Look at, look at the subject matter, ladies and gentlemen. They're nothing. I mean, some of them have deep meaning, but others are just routine. Hey, you should know this. Hey, you should know this. And this is something about a guy. You took the trouble to follow halfway around the globe and listed the aid and services of the UAE authorities to break into his room, photocopy his passport, and then once they get to Malaysia in, in employ special branches of the Malaysian government mm -hmm. to photograph them and monitor them with hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic what are those mics? And, and, and you don't tell the FBI, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to me and it shouldn't make sense to you. It's the glaring thing, why, what was going on here? So you put it all together and the only thing I can come up with was, is, as I've written and as I've said, they didn't want to upset the Saudis and they didn't want the FBI and the former John O'Neill to go on his own mission, take over the case, surveil these people, arrest them, and then cause the Saudis an embarrassment and interfere with the greater big U.S.-Saudi relationship because it comes down to mm -hmm. oil. And that's what it's all about. The spilled blood on 9-11 has less value than the price of light sweet crude. That's mm. the sad, sad truth and reality to it. Because you have Omar Abayumi, who's a Saudi operative living in San Diego, who lied through his teeth, who we know from other witnesses, went to meet the hijackers when they arrived in LA. He drove up to meet them. He just didn't have a chance meeting. He actually went to the restaurant to meet them there. We have witness statements on that. Yeah. Just the whole thing. It was all preordained, pre-planned. I believe, and I think circumstantially, I could prove in a court of law mm. that there was an effort on part of the CIA to allow the Saudi Mabahif in the form of Omar Bayoum in the U.S. to monitor the two boys that came over from Malaysia and to report back what they did. 
As we know, Khalil Amidhar was in America for a while. He left in 2001, in the spring of 2001, for the birth of his daughter back in Yemen. While he was there, he went to Afghanistan. He lost his passport. He is actually Saudi, so he goes back to Saudi Arabia, to Jeddah, to the Jeddah consulate, where all the hijackers who were Saudis got their passport, their visas put in, and he gets a new visa to the U.S. Now, so you're talking about a man who the CIA had followed halfway around the globe, loses his passport, gets another one in Saudi Arabia, and he's allowed to get a visa because, wait a second, he's the same guy that lived in the house in Sano who you're monitoring, who you followed around the globe. So you grant him another visa? You don't put something in the system that says no, no visa to this man? And moreover, we know the Saudis admitted when, we get, when they gave him a new passport, they put a code, a chip in his, in his passport that identified him as a terrorist, someone leaning toward terrorism, someone who's a danger to the kingdom. Man, this doesn't wash. Mm. This, a blind person could see the evidence that something was deeper there. And again, not that anybody wanted to be, these attacks to happen. What they tried to do was try to see if they could find out more about Al-Qaeda and maybe try to recruit somebody of the cell, in particular, Khalil al-Midhar, because he just had a baby, had a family, so he's more a family man, he might have something more to live for. Mm. And that went terribly awry. And then it was too late. And I could go on forever. I mean, how about the famous meeting in June 2001, when the CIA came up to see my squad in New York, which I wasn't invited to, mm -hmm. and asked Steve Bongart and Russ Fincher if they held photographs of them. I said, have you ever seen these guys? And Steve, Steve or Russ like, who, who are you talking about? Well, these are their names, but okay, well, where'd, you get, where'd you take the photos from? We can't tell you. So you go to the FBI, request their help to find the two guys in the photographs. I don't even think they gave their full names. And you refuse to tell them where you got the information from, why you had the photographs, why it was important to find them. See, these are the things that the 9-11 Commission just didn't want to address. That's why Phil Zellico hates me and I hate him, but I don't really give a fuck. Right. Because they never looked at it from the point of view that a criminal investigator and a prosecuting attorney would look at it. Mm -hmm. They told a great story. It was a wonderful book. I have to tell you, it learned things about Al-Qaeda that even I didn't even know. I mean, I was like, oh, that really happened? Okay. Uh, it was the story about Middle East. And what, beautiful. It was laid it out fantastically. But it just fell short. Just fell short of that one crucial thing I said before. And I've been saying ever since, you send all these other pieces of information that really don't mean anything, just for information only, information only, information only. And this, the crucial, actionable intelligence, actionable, because you know that they've come into America. You know they have a visa. You could put it in the system, and then it was called text back then, that when they got to the US, an alarm would go off, silent alarm, okay? And you know we would know they came in. And the Bureau could have, we, we knew, because we knew from the NSA, the NSA has the ability uh, to find out flight information. So we, we knew where they were, what plane they were on, what seat they were in. We could have been at the airport to surveil them and never would have been out of our sight. Could have gotten a FISA order from a judge to confiscate and go through their luggage, could have, put bugs in the apartments that they rented, bugs in their cars. That didn't happen. Two terrorists. At least one that you knew was a terrorist because he lived in a home that Bin Laden's people were calling at the switchboard in Sana Yemen. Again, you follow him halfway around the globe and then he comes to America and there's no one there to greet him, so to speak. Come on, man. It doesn't pass the smell test. And it's just, this is... This is the thing that burns. This is the thing that's the eternal question. And we just want time to go by and for all of it to go away and for me to shut up. Mm. And that's it. That's what they want. And they're going to get it. A friend of mine said to me once, he says, you know, Mark, you know, our jobs, this is a foreign policeman, he said, our jobs like the casino. So what do you mean? He goes, the house always wins. Mm. You fight with the house, you lose. You can't upset the power. You threaten the power, you're going to get fucked. 
they're going to go, they're going to go after you. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's what uh, happened. I'd like to return to 1996. 96 seems to be a key year because uh, that's when uh, the construction of the Alex station began. Uh, David, yeah. Co David Cohen actually is the head of the CIA's director of operations. And he went to create mm -hmm. a virtual station that would meant to, to uh, fuse intelligence disciplines into one mm -hmm. office, like right. the FBI and the CIA. Um, mm -hmm. Cohen actually chose Michael Scheuer, who was an analyst then running the uh, uh, mm -hmm. Islamic extremist mm -hmm. branch. He became its station chief. Uh, what did, was this the right choice at the time regarding Scheuer? No. Mike, Mike is, was, is a very brilliant and dedicated guy. His brain is like a computer. But I believe he's just a little off center. He said some things that really are mm. off the wall. In particular, saying, you know, the only, saying the only thing that happened on 9 11, only good thing that happened on 9 11 was the towers falling on John O'Neill. Yeah. That's a sick statement. That's a very sick warp statement to say about other yes. human beings. Yes. I mean, you could say that if about, you no, know, if it was Charles Manson, maybe there, but no. Um, no. And, you know, and again, <laughs> if the public only knew, because it's not a movie. Uh, the people that we have in the government, some of the dedicated, some of look at and say, how the hell did you get here? How the hell did you get a job in this place? Mm. But Mike had been an analyst, um, predominantly working espionage matters uh, and, and the director of intelligence for many, many years. And he's a brilliant guy, very smart. And again, a brand good computer. And when Dave Cohen had been an analyst too, never a case officer. And then within the CIA, there's also this analyst case officer rub this jealousy this backstabbing this you know you're just an intelligence analyst you know or you're just a, you're just a knuckle dragging case officer you're just a wine and cheese guy who wants to go out and screw around um and i and george Tennant had made cohen the ddo in an effort to shake things up at the agency which a lot of people were not happy about because mm -hmm. we're putting Alice in charge and director of operations and then moreover now cohen picks a fellow analyst to run this operational station called Alex Station, uh, which was, was just, as you said, was designed to be off off campus in, in, a, in an office building somewhere in the DC area. But it was it was a CIA station, just like you have CIA station, Paris, Rome, mm -hmm. London, whatever. It's, it's a true station. Um, but then but when I got there, it had moved into the original headquarters building, right. OHP. Hmm. by the time I got there. And, um, it, it, you know, when you walk through our doors, you were really in another station. It's like you, were, you weren't in headquarters, you were in our station. Hmm. Semantics, I guess. But it was an interesting experience. It was the, you know, I, I, I learned a lot. Um, I was in awe of the CIA's capabilities, and I still am. I mean, they are an incredible organization they have access to information that you can't even dream of and the rapidness uh, they mm. can get information their computers are so far advanced than the fbi's ever will but they never go to court that's really one of the core reasons they're, they're just an intelligence agency they, they, FBI, everything an fbi agent does is documented for the record for eventual use in trial mm. so it's a much different mentality uh I, again i couldn't believe the speed at which they just got things done or sent communications or how fast and hard they worked researching, analyzing their, their databases that captured everything that someone could pull up information that, you know, even Google can't even imagine. And, and, and the way they spend money to get things done, you know, yeah, get a plane, go here. Get, I mean, it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. the, FBI, the FBI is a law enforcement organization at the same time being an intelligence organization, but that's not the story. Um, but Mike, Mike lost his way. Mike lost his way thinking that he was, you know, the sun and the moon and the stars when it came to any subject that he was working on. Uh -huh. And in particular, when it came to Al Qaeda, he despised the FBI, despised John O'Neill. He thought that FBI agents, he only thought the only good FBI agent was Danny Coleman, the one of the day before me. He hated me. Uh, you know, that we were all just. I don't know what we were, but to him, but just not worthy of even having a clearance to do the job. Shame, shame, because so much can be done working together. Together, and right. 
and he alienated so many people. And he brought over all these other analysts with him to be with him in Alex Station, who had some of that same mentality mm. that crossed over. But I became friends. I mean, I'm a very personable person. I like to think personable guy. And I made friends quickly, and I made friends uh, with the people there. Some of them didn't. Uh, one friend in particular who's death I mourn all the time was Jennifer Matthews, uh, who eventually was blown up in Afghanistan. Jennifer was just a gem, a gem of a human being. Just, man, just what a waste. What a shame. Anyway, um, but Mike was removed, you know, in April 99 uh, because um, at the time when I got to Alex Station, you know, Danny was gone. And there was no senior FBI representative to Alex Station either. That person had gone. So there was an open slot for what's called a GS-15, which is basically mm. an ASAC level. <clears throat> I was a GS-13 at the time. So the chart, the employment chart, if you will, whatever you call that thing, called for having a GS-15 from FBI headquarters as a co um as a co-deputy chief of Alex Station, along with a CIA 15. She had Mike Shoyer, what's called uh, SIS, Senior Intelligence Service. And you had a slot for deputy chief, CIA, deputy chief FBI. And in April 99, uh, Edward Getz, Eddie Getz, uh, a senior FBI agent from FBI headquarters who had been overworking Hezbollah over in main CTC, main, main counter-terror center, was then sent over. And when he got there, Eddie said, okay, I want, I'm gonna, okay, where's my release authority? Release authority is basically you have the authority to send the document out the door. It may not seem like a big deal, but like, like let's say if I was still an FBI agent, FBI supervisor, and the agent on my squad writes a document to go to headquarters. Well, that document has to come to me first and I have to approve it or not to send it out the door. So essentially Ed Getz wanted that responsibility to send out the door, whether it was to CIA station Rome, Afghanistan, or for headquarters, a communication from Alec. And that's where Shoyer blew his fucking gasket. And they had a screening, they had a screening match that you could hear well, you had to be, you could be in the next county, you could have heard it. I mean, mm. it was poof. And Eddie stormed out, went right over back to CTC, went to the head of CTC. I think at the time, I think it was Jeff O'Connell. And Jeff went up to the then DDO, Jack Devine. And Jack Devine could not stand Mike Shoyer. And Jack Devine said to George, you go, see, I finally got what I needed. I get rid of him. He goes, okay, you have my authority to get rid of him. And he was gone that day. Right. Sure, he was gone. And then he was replaced with another gentleman who had been in George's inner circle. I don't know if I'm allowed to say his name. If you could say his name, I can't confirm or deny it. Uh, but, and he liked me. We got along very well. Um, can, we, can we call him RB if, if you're short? Or? Yeah, you can, sure, you can call him what you want. Right. Okay. And, um, and, we got along well, um, but there was, but that further eroded my relationship with the remaining Shoyer people that were in Alex Station. Oh. Right, yeah, because FBI was the reason he was kicked out, right? That's how, they, inter point. Yeah, sure. That's how they interpreted it. You know, not the fact that he was an obstinate idiot and wouldn't let Eddie have release authority, it's all he had to do, but no, it was FBI's fault, and that fell down to me. Um, and they were already uh, they were already hesitant to deal with you at the beginning. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, wow. You know, it was like, you know, but you know, you make friends, you smile, you laugh, you go along. Mm. You, you're not confrontational. I'm not confrontational, and neither was Doug. And you know, again, you know, Doug was assigned there. This is your know, government great at work and spending uh, money. Or, or I don't know what the proper way to explain this is, but like, because I remember when I got there and Doug came, I don't know, 
like a month or two after me. And he said, hey, you know, I'm here. I'm, I'm here from WFO. And I said, oh, that's great. He said, and I and not that I really give a shit. I said, why are you here? You know, like, didn't say it like me, like, well, you know, I go, why are you here? Because, you know, I didn't think that WFO had a relationship with Alex Station. And WFO didn't have Al-Qaeda, right? New York, my squad was the Al-Qaeda squad. And he said, he said, brother, he said, look, I think WFO, WFO figured if New York has a body there, we better have a body there. <laughs> so permission, I said, I said, well, welcome to the club. At least I got a friend, you know, and I mean, we're still great friends. So I love them. Um, but if it wasn't for Doug, we wouldn't be talking because mm -hmm. Doug is the one that wrote the communication, not me. Right. Doug wrote. Right. Uh, Doug felt it was it warranted the FBI knowing about this. And he was right. So, you know, Doug's a smart man, he's a CPA. He's not an idiot. You know, he has a brain. That's what you expect government employees to do, have a brain and say, hey, you know what? This is this is a terrorist following halfway around the globe. I say that all the time, I know, because of emphasis. Has a visa to come to the US. And we better tell the FBI because it potentially, if it comes to the US, it's going to be the FBI's case. Why that didn't happen is what the 9 11 Commission has never and never will drill down upon. Mm -hmm. And if I was a family member who lost somebody, I would sue the government and put those people on the stand and mm -hmm. demand to know. Why didn't you do that? That's all you got to do. Simple as that. It's nothing more, nothing less. And again, none of this bullshit about planting bombs and that the towers mm -hmm. came down and Israel and Iraq and the war and you wanted to start it in George Bush. No, shut the fuck up. Mm -hmm. It was an effort for recruitment, an effort to keep the FBI from not embarrassing the US government by maybe arresting the Saudis that were in America and causing an international hoopla. Mm -hmm. And it got away from them. And that's what happened. Khalil Amidhar was lost. They lost track of him. He even came back to the US, but there was still no stop on his name. Mm -hmm. And then well, it wasn't until August 21st. Right. Mm. 2001, my birthday, and John's last day in the FBI, right around that time, where they finally sent a communication to FBI headquarters, which then was sent to New York. Mm -hmm. CIA finally sent a communication to FBI headquarters, and then headquarters to New York, not by me, say, can you help us locate these people? And it was, it was indicated routine. Mm -hmm. Routine in FBI jargon means you have 30 days to return back the lead. So you, Adam Fitzgerald, I'm an FBI agent in New York. You're an FBI agent in Cleveland. You send to me, you send to New York, a lead to New York. It comes to my desk, routine, go, in, go interview, I don't know, Mario Cuomo, well, Andrew Cuomo, go interview. I've got 30 days to do that. And get back to you. Okay. If you if you mark it, uh, I forget what it was, it was immediate, something like that. If you got like four days, five days, or something's happy to do like in a day. Okay. It like, I, but it was marked routine. So even that is like, oh well. So you came to New York in June saying, you have any information on these guys? You knew back in January. 2000 that they were part of a terrorist summit because that's how even you described it in your papers you know the sun bothering yeah the sun's coming in my room and yet you send it routine does it make sense at the end of august when everybody's on vacation and it came to a brand new agent now that grants that agent had been a police officer before so he was very very astute and knew how to investigate cases knew what to do rob fuller rob's a great guy hmm. but, it, but 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 there's like okay i got 30 days okay 
I'll find, I'll, I'll go, I'll go do my logical checks. I'll go to the hotels. I'll, I'll mm-hmm. do what I got to do. I'll run the databases I got to run, but I got 30 days. Well, why didn't you put an immediate? If you're looking for it, why don't you, why don't you go to the fucking newspapers and the television stations and say, the FBI is leak looking for, this is not, I'm not, I'm not talking about, I'm not saying, why did the CIA come to the FBI and say, look, you got to help us. Can you go on national TV and put a put a picture on these guys? We want to look for them right away. Why don't you do that? Why? And again, it's only because you monitored them in Malaysia and took pictures of them and knew that they came to America in March 2000 when the cable was sent from Malaysia Station to CIA in New York, CIA in LA, saying they've come, they we have confirmation they got to america that's not routine pal that's not oh just fell through the cracks this is terrorists that you learned about only because you were monitoring a terrorist switchboard in sana yemen that had been involved in the uss coal bombing and the east africa bombings so it doesn't make sense. It doesn't wash. And no one should accept the non-answer. Right. That that goes back to the, uh, what I think you were referring to, was the August 21st uh, principals meeting, uh, where yes. Richard, Blee, Richard Blee met with Richard Clark, and yet Blee and um, I believe uh, George Tennant still didn't share uh, the full names of the hijackers that were inside the United States, even until then. No. Um, and still, uh, they still withheld this information from the FBI and the State Department, no less. Yeah, you, can't, you can't just excuse this as an oversight. Could you when come you closer? Have... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and let me let me shut the shade. Hold on. And, and you can't just excuse this as an oversight when you have a documented past practice of sending information that comes nowhere near the level of exigency and, and vitality. That's the whole thing. You know, everybody, I want to make this point, everybody in America, well, not everybody, but um, too many are under this fucking delusion that the FBI and CIA never shared anything beforehand. I mean, I think how, that, you know, how people believe that is just beyond me. This is the whole thing. There's patented, provable, probative records that show information passed in the form of CIRs and other, and mm-hmm. other methods called an IIR as well, between the FBI and CIA and other members of the intelligence community, hundreds, if not thousands, a day. I saw them. I was. I wrote them. I know it. So to have people now like brainwashed or just ignorant that oh well they didn't share anything before but now they do it's total horseshit. And that's the thing. Have a trial. Subpoena the information. The government record. There's a footnote in the 9/11 Commission report. It's a footnote that gives a number to the amount of CIRs that went to the FBI or is from the CIA or vice versa. Mm-hmm. I'm not a footnote. Neither are you. Neither are those dead people. Those dead people are not footnotes. Mm. Okay? This thing is a footnote. But they never explored it further and said, okay, let's look at the subject matter. Each one of those. Okay, we can't reveal the actual intelligence. Let's look at, let's look, let's, let's look at the subject matter and see how important that is comparison to the fact that we followed a guy all the way from Sana to Malaysia, photographed him, took audio. And everything else we did. And he's got a visa to come to the US. And that doesn't rise to the level to tell the FBI. That's pathetic. Mm. That's pathetic. And this is what I've been trying to push 
for uh, well, the last 15 years. Because for a long time, I kept my mouth shut. I didn't say anything. Uh, but in uh, 2007 is when I started to talk. Right. And I started to talk to a lot of reporters, what was on my mind. And also related, of course, to Iraq, how they lied about trying to tie 9-11 and well, Al-Qaeda to Saddam Hussein to justify the invasion. And I know that was just total horseshit. And of course, history has proven me correct, but there are still fucking idiots out there in our country that still believe that the Saddam has something to do with 9-11. I had even one mm-hmm. moron tell me, oh, the president's access to information even you don't have access to. I said, what are you serious? I wrote the fucking president's terrorism threat report and threat matrix, you idiot. Come on. But again, people will believe what they want to believe because they're just mm-hmm. ignorant and stupid mm-hmm. and easily manipulated. Uh, manipulated. But this is when I started to talk to reporters in particular, and then was put in James Banford's book. Mm-hmm. And then when James Banford's book came out, one month later, I was told I was under investigation. January 2008, and I was told to investigate. The book came out, hit the pub, hit the newsstands in January and February 2008, I was told I was under investigation. So you know what? You know what? You fuck with the house, you lose. Mm. And there we are. Is there is there a reason why, uh, which, which I find fascinating too? At the same time, you're the only person out of Alex Station that has come public. Uh, is there a reason why other people haven't come public? No, I know this. I know certain certain CIA case agents won't. But no, is there a reason? Wouldn't. No, uh, I don't think. I don't. I don't. That's a very very good question. I think it's fear. Uh, and Doug is still in the FBI, and Doug was interviewed once. When I was still in public affairs, I, I authorized him to be interviewed by a newspaper. There's only one interview of Doug, and Doug said to the reporter, and they'll tell you, well, you have to ask them. They must have had a very good reason. But none of them will talk. None of them want to talk. Mm-hmm. And the only people involved are maybe about three or four. That's it. And they're not saying a word. They're not saying a damn thing. The others had no part of it. The other, the other people, Alex Station, had no part of it. We're talking about only maybe three or four people that were the point people to stop Doug's communication going. Right. right. Now they now of course those people actually uh, were held anonymous in the 9-11 commission. Yes, they uh, were. Right. And they they gave testimony and whatnot, but that's the only time that's that the they ever they yeah, that's the only they time lied. they ever came and they lied. Yeah, they, they basically lied. Oh, of course, they, they, no, they right. did lie. They basically, yeah. they did lie. They lied. Absolutely. In particular, one person lying. And again, this is the whole thing where it's farcical. One person in particular, when asked, said that he, she brought the communication to right. the right. 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 Mm-hmm. And there's no record of that person entering our building. Right. So, okay, let's just, let's just stop. Let's just stop right there. Why would you not send it in official channels? Why would you not send it in a in the top secret encrypted official channels that we have? Mm-hmm. So you brought a hand copy? Come on, man. What do you think? We're all fucking stupid. And again, that's not followed up. No one goes beyond that lie. Oh no, we can't go there. Why not? Well, I know why not, because you don't want to lose the whole trust of the intelligence community. You want people to do their job without fear of retribution or retaliation. We're talking about 3,000, nearly 3,000 people who died. Let's not, let's, let's just talk about, also, we never talk about the people that were wounded, that died of cancer, hmm. but the families that were affected, the children and the aunts and the cousins really that still don't have their father, mother, aunt, brother still around, that the pain, the emotional pain of that, of that attack, the fallout from that. And we just kind of go, oh, oh well, let it go. It's okay. No, it's not okay. When someone look me in the eye, and tell me why Doug's memo didn't go. Just admit it. The truth actually is very liberating. It's actually, you feel good when you get off your chest. You know, Mark Twain said, you know, never lie. That way you never have to remember what you said the first time. So these people, and because telling the truth is a sense of relief because it wasn't that bad. I told the truth and it's okay. Just tell the truth. Just say, we didn't send it because we didn't want the FBI to interfere. And we wanted the CIA to let the Saudis try to recruit somebody. 
Mm. Just admit it. Okay, we can live with that. It's not. It, it's twenty years now. We're not going to. You know, it's it's also okay. It's okay. But to not have that proverbial closure is is disheartening. Even it's even before even before September left even happened, the FBI was met with seemingly uh, res with with strict resistance. Uh, for example, uh, John O'Neill uh, was tasked to the um, the U.S.'s coal bombing on October yeah. 12 of 2000, and yeah, he was met he was met with resistance from U.S. Yemen Ambassador Barbara Boudin. Yeah, can you yeah. explain? Can you explain a little bit what happened in this uh, incident? Well, yeah, it's. Again, all these people want to protect their own territory, their own turf. They all believe they're all self-important. And some would probably say the same thing about me. Uh, we all think we're important. But again, the State Department has its overarching agenda. The State Department is the U.S. government. It's the administration. And she, in her job as a direct representative of the, of the president in that country, believed that by controlling the situation and not letting the FBI control the situation. And particularly when it came to the FBI agent security, remember the whole long gun issue where she refused to let the FBI agents carry rifles and machine guns to protect the FBI agents who were in country because yeah. she said that they yeah. defend the Yemenis. Mm -hmm. We were trying to foster a relationship with them by having agents walking around with long guns sent the wrong picture because she's the house. State Department is the House. The House always wins. Remember, FBI offices around the globe are in their house. We rent space from them, as does the CIA. But the CIA has a better relationship because it's more historical. And the CIA is seen as an intelligence gathering arm of the administration, which feeds to the, to the State Department. So there's, there's, there's more of a contractual relationship. Yeah, we know... We, we understand, Mr. Ambassador, those FBI agents, they really are, they're really new to the game. They don't understand that mm. you're really the power. And this was the frustrating thing. What she did is unforgivable. And she then PNG, she allowed, she, she, she did not allow O'Neill to return to the country. Right. Because remember, it's unlike the movies, you know, when I was traveling around the globe for the agency, for the government, I would write a communication and it would be really addressed to the ambassador of that embassy saying, Mark Rossini is coming, blah, 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 blah. And of course, they went to their deputy or whoever handles that issue, but that person could deny or allow you to come in the country because there was no room in the end that the embassy was full, let's say, or there was something else going on that was not FBI related, but there'd be too many people in the house. So there's no room for you. So you can't come. And Ms. Bourdain saw her to personally not allow John back. And John didn't have a good relationship with Louis Free. So Louis Free, who had gone after Bill Clinton, uh, wasn't in a exact position to protest. And John was not allowed back. Right. So it's these stupid little things that are that reality, not a movie. Okay. And Sometimes it just comes down to that personal animosity, hatred, because we're just kids still in a sandbox in kindergarten. Actually, kids in a sandbox get along better. Right. Uh, adults fuck everything up. But this but, is where we are, Adam. <laughs> right. Uh, well, you know, John O'Neill was actually really respected in terms of uh, the counterterrorism unit. Um, and the FBI in New York was basically the epicenter for information regarding counterterrorism in the yeah. world, uh, and for, for the United States at least. Um, and this goes back even to the 1993 mm -hmm. bombing. You had some great case agents there, uh, Frank Pellegrino, John Antisov, great guys, great people. Um, did that create a sheer jealousy between Scheuer and O'Neill because of that? No, 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 no. Mike, Mike, Mike was concerned. It was, it was just, it was, his hatred was more toward O'Neill and just, he actually his hatred for his own people too. He even, he even despised, 
people in the CIA he despised case officers. He thought they were just knuckle draggers. Like I said, they were cowboys right. going out and screwing around the, around the globe on the government's mm. dime. I mean, he thought he was like Svengali. He thought he was just, he still thinks that he is, that he's the genius. Mm -hmm. um, sad, sad. He even hated his own people. Now they hated him. <laughs> they hated him. God, the remarks that I could tell you that I heard right. people say right. at meetings where I was in the executive floor, like, oh, that fucking nut again. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, no, no. So uh, after 9-11 after happened, um, it, now the intelligence came in showing that the CIA certainly did hold back information right. which could have which could have prevented at Absolutely. least part at least part of the operation. What was the reaction of superiors in New York uh, regarding the information that that was coming into uh, people like Ali Soufan, who was shown the photographs immediately afterwards? Yeah, just shock, disbelief, anger. Uh, Ali sure. grew up, you know, uh, incredulous to fact. But again, you know, you're like Don Quixote finding a windmill. Who do you complain against? Who do you, people like, you know, Kenny Maxwell and Pat DeMauro and my superiors in New York, mm. they don't know. Well, who do they fight? Who, who, who do you hit? Who do you hit? Who do you, and then you, then the government creates the 9 11 Commission, which you think, okay, wow, something's going to happen. And nothing. No one wants, no one was going to be held responsible. Right. No, they didn't want that to protect the agency, to protect the individual being sued, to be mm. bankrupt, being jailed. Right. There's, again, I, on my 20 page document, I mm. write a whole page on that as to why. And <clears throat> that is really it, Adam. Um, you know, there are great people out there like Terry Strada, who's the chairman of 9 11 Widows uh, mm -hmm. Foundation, who are fighting for this justice. And we have the JASTA Act now, of mm -hmm. course, suing the government of Saudi Arabia. Just want answers, man. Just tell the world why you didn't send Doug's memo. That's all you have mm -hmm. to do. And the refusal to do that is despicable. But again, they're just hoping that time will go on, people will die, people will forget. People, people don't give a shit. They're so busy not worried about their mortgage, their rent, putting food on the table, this damn pandemic. People don't care. People don't care. Maybe in maybe another 10 years, when it'll be 30 years, maybe there'll be documents released, or maybe there will be a trial where some of them are called to testify. Uh, like there's the upcoming Gitmo trials. Okay, yes. there's gonna be trials, and I'm gonna be a witness there. In, oh, you really? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I've been I've been told I've been being going to be called by the prosecution and the defense. Like, okay, fine. What do you want me to say? Now I'm on the list. Um, but again, those have been pushed back because of COVID. That was supposed to happen January this year. Right, right. right. Exactly. right. Um, oh, let, me, let me ask you about the trial, Mark. Um, what, what are you expecting out of that trial? Well, I think there's... I know, Adam, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't... I don't know. I know there's several subjects on trial, and um, you know, there the the defense, you know, is is that they alone should not be held responsible. Right. There, there's, a, there's a greater thing going on, uh, as far as I understand it, and obviously the prosecution wants to establish that they're terrorists, mm -hmm. but. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I I don't even I don't think it'll ever happen. Quite frankly, the trial uh, itself. The trial is yeah yeah yeah. I don't think the trials will ever happen. It's just it's it's at this point. Again, does anybody care? I mean, those people care because they're in Guantanamo, but they're never going to get out anyway. So what's the point? Uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and others they're there forever. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think, you know, what we should have had, we should have had trials in the Southern District of New York that they wanted to, of course, the Republicans, right, exactly. the Republicans, you know, use it as a political thing and went after the Democrats on it, went after Eric Holder. They should have had the trials in New York, you know, all this horse shit or safety, security. Oh, you shut the fuck up. Hmm. 
it was just politics. It was just like Hillary with, his e with her emails. You're just doing it for political purposes. Mm -hmm. That's all you're doing it for. And you're playing for the stupid lemmings. That's all you're doing it for. Should have had those trials in New York. Top front dead center should have had them in New York. Oh, did, they, did, they, they, did, did they make a, did, they surely made a mistake in getting the FBI off of the, the interrogation of Abu Zubaydah. Immediately afterwards, the CIA became uh, the head agency and started torturing these people right off the bat. Even, 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 even on Sheikh al Libby. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was involved in all of that, man. It's just, you know, you know, when it comes to Abu Zubaydah, you know, Ali and Steve Garda would, you know, wiped his ass, prayed with the guy. Mm -hmm. And he started to talk. But of course, in the great minds of people at Alex Station, oh, he's lying. They're taking too long to talk to him. He's lying. What is this? What do you live in a fucking movie? What do you hear James Bond music in your head? Mm -hmm. Let this play out, man. Oh no, you you people don't know what you're talking about. It's gonna be another attack soon. Better get to him, better torture him. Mm -hmm. Torture is the desire for small men and fools. Because you know why people think torture will work? Because they know it would work on them. But to a jihadist, he's a hill of shit. You're going to torture somebody that actually, before you caught him, wanted to die. Hmm. Willing to blow themselves up. That's good logic there, Sherlock. You're going to torture a guy who wants to die. Hmm. How about you torture him? He says, thank you, because Allah is going to reward me more for enduring this. Doesn't cross your fucking mind, because we listened to two stupid fucking asshole psychiatrists that gave this playbook on what they should do and to get in their heads. You know what I despise? I, I'm a... People, someone said to me, you know, interviewing Mark Rossini, terrorism expert, terrorism expert. I said, stop. I said, I'm not a terrorism expert. He looked at me and says, and no one is. No one that you have on any show. You know why they're not a terrorism expert? Because they're not a terrorist. Only a terrorist is a terrorism expert. We're just trying to play catch up. So you get these two fucking psychiatrists, these dimwits who should be in jail. But bamboozling the intelligence community and they go along with the strategy of torture, we're gonna to get them, yeah, macho man, yeah. You're attacking the problem from your Western point of view. You attack the problem from their point of view. You talk to them like they need to be too in their tongue, in their language, in their culture. And the universal culture of showing them some humanity because they've never had humanity in their whole goddamn life, which is why they're so fucking warped. So you sit with them, you pray with them, you give them water, you wipe their ass when they're in their hospital bed. You show them a shred of humanity that you are a human too. And they begin to talk. George Pirro, one of the greatest FBI agents ever in the FBI, who interviewed Saddam Hussein. You know what George did? He brought him cookies that his mom made. George was George is Syrian, right? And George, so he brought his cookies that George's mom made, knowing that Saddam would like them. And he opened up because he didn't see him as a threat. He said, Oh, this guy's showing me kindness. And he actually means it, because George is actually a wonderful human being, and he means it. But you gotta go in some macho tirade by torturing somebody mm -hmm. come on man to a person who wants to die mark if it, oh, you, if the trial were to come true and next year the trial commits are you are you afraid of the fact that the defense for these uh suspects yeah. are going to want the court to throw out the coerced testimonies of these suspects i have no problem with that at all really it's coerced. It's not the truth. Ibn al Sheikh Al Libi said, I lied so they would stop. Right. Tortured Ibn al Sheikh Al Libi to force him to admit, admit, to say that there was a connection between Al Qaeda mm. and Saddam Hussein. Mm -hmm. And he said, I only said it to make them stop because they just kept wanting to hear it. And that was Dick Cheney, that criminal, war criminal. Right. Ordered that and wanted that done. Mm. So it's just, yes. 
Nothing gained from torture has any value. Even John McCain said it, for Christ's sakes. But of course, you know, he's, he doesn't know anything. Well, he's dead now, but even when he was alive, I thought, oh, what do you know? What do you know? He spent fucking six years in the Hanoi Hilton. What do you know? Mm. Assholes sitting there, gold plated toilet seats, not knowing how the real fucking world works, mm. dictating how things are supposed to go around the globe. You know, read the, read the book, To Kill a Mockingbird, my favorite book. Atticus Finch mm. says, Young Scout recites it. You never know somebody until you stand in their shoes. We have to put ourselves in the shoes of these people to understand what makes them tick, what drove them to that point. And we fail to do that every time. John Brennan, when he was my boss at the NCTC, I love that man. John said, you know what? We're never gonna win this with bombs and bullets. We've got to reach out to these people and change the way these governments govern. We've got to change the economic systems of these countries. We have to make their lives better so they don't turn to terrorism right. as a way as a way out. Right. But that's that's sissy, that's soft, really tough. Gotta to kill them, gotta bomb them. <laughs> Doesn't solve a goddamn thing. Is is Al know. is Al Qaeda still a threat? Uh, yes, it is. Still yes, of course it is. You don't hear much about it anymore, but basically Al Qaeda has been swallowed up, if you will, by ISIS or the ISIS movement or the ISIS ideology, the Salafist ideology, ideology whatever, whatever word you want to use. Mm. But Al Qaeda is still a threat. Now, of course, I'm gone from the government. I have no knowledge of Al Qaeda cells, where they're operating, what's going on. But, you know, allegedly, Ayman Zawahri uh, is still alive. But then I heard a rumor that he's dead. Uh, but I think it'd be dead by now anyway. But Al Qaeda is still a threat, as far as I understand. My Ali Safan says so, so I have to go with what Ali, Ali says. He monitors it more than I do. Um, uh, what, what are you doing anyway. today? What are you doing these days, Marsh? Well, I do I do private consulting. I have a handful of clients that hire me to pick my brain. And to help them figure out strategy and do some risk assessment and to conduct, uh, you know, investigations for them. I hate to use the word investigations, fact finding missions. I rather refer to it uh, around the globe, and that's what I'm doing, trying to keep my head above water and get through this life. Sure. Um, and you know. Uh, but I don't forget. I mean, it's getting late here. Yeah, right. I, I was just going to ask you one more question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, my final question would be this, Mark. What would you want for people to remember you about? Um, what would you like to for the public to know uh, and, ho and hopeful for the future about uh, a new investigation of sorts? All I want people to know is that the attacks didn't have to happen if Doug's memo had been shared. <clears throat> and we have to get down to understanding and finding out the truth as to why that memo was not shared. Mm -hmm. And that is all I want to know. And all I think people should want to know as well. About me, I'm nobody. <laughs> I'm nobody. Uh, I just happen to be there. And maybe sometimes I wish that it had been somebody else because maybe they would have said, "Fuck you!" I'm telling the FBI. Mm. I'm going to I'm going to send the cable. I'm going to send the I'm going to make a cut and paste of the cable and send it anyway. Sometimes I wish I had been someone else there instead of me. Right. Maybe maybe it would have been better. I I don't agree. Um, so you know, right, to, to end yeah to end this, but um, you're you're an important figure, and I consider you a, a hero of sorts. You're the first protest uh, against the malfeasance of the CIA. And without you, uh, we wouldn't know what really would have happened there at the CIA itself, at Alex Station anyway. And um, I just want you to remember that. Well, thank you, Adam. It's very, very kind of you. It's, unfortunately, I can't say a lot because of secrecy rules right. and, yep. you know, and all that. I'm still bound by them till the day I die. Uh, I think you got an idea of what went on. Yeah. Well, Mark, thank you very much for coming on. My pleasure. Sure enough.